Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Catherine Forbes. Catherine earned her bachelor's in chemistry from Occidental College in 2018. During her time there, she developed an innovative approach to the synthesis of stereogenic at phosphorus building blocks, and she also served as a teaching fellow for Advanced Organic Chemistry as well as Introductory Organic Chemistry Lab. And with that, I'll let you get started, Catherine. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk today about my research during my time in the Jacobson Lab at Harvard focused on the enantioselective synthesis of stereogenic and phosphorus 5 building blocks. So to begin, because we're talking about an unconventional form of chirality today that may be unfamiliar to some people watching and listening, I wanted to start with a brief introduction about enantiomers to help highlight the underlying motivation for this research. So enantiomers are stereoisomers of a chiral molecule that share identical molecular formulas, atom-to-atom linkages, and bond distances, but cannot be superimposed. In other words, enantiomers share the same structural elements and structural connectivity, but they occupy opposite relative orientations in 3D space. And as a consequence, enantiomers often exhibit different behavior in biological systems because biomolecules such as proteins are chiral themselves, and will often interact with opposite enantiomers of a chiral molecule differently. And this has implications that can be directly observed. For example, L-DOPA is a chiral molecule that has been used as a treatment for Parkinson's disease, while its enantiomer, D-DOPA, is inactive in this context. Additionally, the natural product Carvone is a chiral molecule where one enantiomer smells like caraway, and the opposite enantiomer smells like mint. And these same differences can be observed for chiral at phosphorus compounds. So phosphorus 5, as well as phosphorus 3, is capable of being chiral. And as it turns out, phosphorus 5 stereocenters are a key feature of many bioactive compounds, including pharmaceuticals. And oftentimes, the absolute stereochemistry at phosphorus determines these molecules' biological activity. For example, cefosbuvir is a chiral phosphoramidate prodrug that is used as a hepatitis C treatment, which is over 10 times more potent than its corresponding epimer in phosphorus. So, evidently, the absolute configuration of a chiral molecule can have a significant effect on its biological activity, and consequently, it is important to have approaches and methods for accessing these molecules in their enantioenriched or diastereomerically enriched form, particularly in a pharmaceutical context. And one robust and reliable way for doing so in the synthesis of stereogenic at carbon compounds is to construct these targets using chiral building blocks from the chiral pool. The chiral pool is the collection of chiral molecules that nature produces in abundance that can be isolated, sold by chemical suppliers, and used by synthetic chemists as starting materials in the synthesis of chiral targets of interest. These building blocks include amino acids, sugars, and terpenes, as well as many other compounds. This list is by no means comprehensive, and I have just shown a handful of examples on this slide. And on the right, we can see how the chiral building block Carvone has been applied as a precursor in the synthesis of a broad variety of architecturally complex and stereochemically rich targets. So this is a powerful approach that leverages the chirality that nature has already so generously provided us with to access enantiomer-enriched synthetic targets of interest. However, this is not a viable approach for the synthesis of chiral at phosphorus targets because nature does not produce stereogenic at phosphorus compounds in abundance. Therefore, we rely on de novo synthesis to access these molecules, which is the development of synthetic methods for doing so. So in order to contemplate how one might go about developing synthetic methods to access stereogenic at phosphorus compounds, I want to discuss a couple of key classes of reactions that can be considered. The first type of reaction is a stereoselective reaction, which is a reaction that shows a preference for the formation of one stereoisomer over another, when both products can be formed by the same mechanism. These reactions often involve the use of a chiral reagent or chiral catalyst to influence the stereochemical outcome. The second type of reaction to consider is a stereospecific transformation, which is a reaction with the mechanism in which only one of the possible stereoisomeric products can be formed. For example, we can see at this bottom example that a single enantiomer of this stereogenic at phosphorus substrate undergoes a concerted nucleophilic substitution reaction which is stereoinvertive in nature, to exclusively yield the enantiomer of product with the inverted configuration. And by far the most well-established and general approach for constructing stereogenic at phosphorus targets uses stereospecific chemistry to access targets of interest by means of chiral auxiliaries. There have been many realizations of this approach, but I have just shown a handful of examples on this slide, which I would say utilize the most versatile strategy which is to use a chiral auxiliary with two distinct functional groups that can form bonds to phosphorus to form a stereogenic at phosphorus building block. These two functional groups can be sequentially and stereospecifically displaced by two different nucleophiles to install substituents of interest onto phosphorus, 
enabling the synthesis of a broad variety of stereogenic and phosphorus targets from a single precursor. And one prominent example of this approach has been reported recently by Phil Barron's lab, who developed this translimonene oxide-derived chiral building block which possesses three distinct leaving groups on phosphorus, which can each be stereospecifically displaced to access a broad variety of targets ranging from methylphosphonate oligonucleotides to chirophosphine oxides with high levels of enrichment. And while the use of chiral auxiliaries represents a very versatile means for accessing stereogenic and phosphorus targets, there is one drawback of this approach, which is that it requires stoichiometric and sometimes superstoichiometric quantities of chiral material, whereas ideally, a more efficient and atom economical approach would only require the use of catalytic amounts of chiral material. And in this vein, there have been many impressive advances in the development of catalytic approaches for accessing stereogenic and phosphorus compounds. One example was reported in 2017 by Merck, in which this chiral bisimidazole catalyst was developed to catalyze the reaction of nucleosides with chlorophosphoramidates to assemble chiral phosphoramidate prodrugs with remarkably high levels of diastereoselectivity. Another example was reported by Scott Miller's lab in 2021, in which chirophosphoric acids catalyze the diastereoselective reaction of nucleosides with phosphoramidites to afford these chiral phosphate oligonucleotides with high levels of selectivity. And these two examples represent significant achievements both practically and fundamentally. From a practical standpoint, these methods selectively produce molecules with great pharmacological value. Fundamentally, these methods represent important advances as stereoselective catalytic syntheses of stereogenic and phosphorus compounds, which remains a significant challenge in organic synthesis. And we were inspired by these catalytic advances, as well as the versatility of the chiral auxiliary approach to this problem, and hypothesized that we could develop a versatile catalytic approach to the synthesis of stereogenic and phosphorus compounds via hydrogen bond donor catalysis. Specifically, we hypothesized that a chiral hydrogen bond donor catalyst could facilitate the enantioselective decimetrization of phosphonic dichlorides by selectively hydrogen bonding to one of the two enantiotopic chlorides on the substrate, activating it to undergo nucleophilic displacement by an amine to furnish enantioenriched chlorophosphonamidates, which could serve as chiral building blocks for the synthesis of stereogenic and phosphorus targets. We pursued this hypothesis, and after initial exploratory experiments, we discovered this system using diastoamylamine as a nucleophile and phenylphosphonic dichloride as an electrophile under cryogenic conditions in diethyl ether to form these chlorophosphonamidate building blocks. However, we discovered that these chlorophosphonamidates were prone to racemization upon isolation at room temperature, so these reactions were quenched with sodium methoxide to afford the less reactive phosphonamidate to enable reliable analysis of enantioselectivity. Importantly, excess amine was required in this reaction as it functions both as a nucleophile and as a base, reacting with the stoichiometric HCl byproduct formed in the nucleophilic substitution reaction. Upon testing different catalysts in this reaction, we discovered that use of this sulfinamide urea catalyst 1A afforded the product in quantitative yield in 95% EE under these conditions. Analysis of the changes in enantioselectivity in response to changing the structure of the catalyst revealed the importance both of the sulfinamide and the hydrogen bond donor for selectivity. Use of a thiourea analog of the catalyst 1B yielded the product with similar, albeit slightly lower, enantioselectivity. A more significant effect was observed using catalyst 1C, which is epimeric at sulfur, which yielded the product with significantly diminished levels of selectivity, indicating the importance of the sulfinamide stereochemistry for selectivity. However, we also see that the sulfinamide is not a competent catalyst on its own, as when we use terbutyl sulfinamide 1D, which lacks the hydrogen bond donor motif, no enantioselectivity is observed. On the other hand, we observed that teratleucine aeroperolidine derived hydrogen bond donor catalysts still gave moderate levels of enantioselectivity in this reaction, indicating that hydrogen bond donors are capable of facilitating this enantioselective reaction without the sulfinamide, albeit with significantly lower levels of enantioselectivity. Taken together, these results are consistent with a mechanism in which the hydrogen bond donor and the sulfinamide act cooperatively to facilitate this highly enantioselective reaction. However, the specific roles of these functional groups remain a subject of further study. Next, we examine the effect of the amine structure on enantioselectivity, and here we saw some interesting effects. Ultimately, diastoamylamine reacted to form the corresponding product with 95% EE, which was the highest level of enantioselectivity of all the amines tested. Generally speaking, dialkyl secondary amines react with the highest levels of enantioselectivity with primary amines, such as benzylamine, affording racemic product. However, beyond these observations, it's difficult to discern any clear steric or electronic trends with respect to the effect of amine structure on AE, and we see relatively large changes in selectivity in response to small changes in amine structure. 
For example, dibenzylamine and n albenzylamine form the product in 84% EE, whereas dialylamine gives 68% EE, and it's difficult to rationalize why that might be. These puzzling effects of amine structure on selectivity led us to pay closer attention to a confounding variable in this reaction, which we'd been aware of from the inception of this project. If you draw the balanced equation of this reaction, you can see that the reaction actually forms two products. In addition to the chlorophosphonamide, an ammonium chloride byproduct is formed via protonation of the excess amine by the stoichiometric equivalent of HCl formed in this reaction. And it has been previously observed that ammonium chloride salts can be potent inhibitors of hydrogen bond donor catalysts. And we therefore questioned whether the perplexing structural effects of the amine on an antiselectivity may be a result of the corresponding ammonium chloride byproducts of each amine and their varying ability to inhibit the catalyst. To begin to investigate this question, we tested the effect of tetrabutyl ammonium chloride on the catalytic reaction by adding increasing quantities of this additive and examining the effect on an antioselectivity and yield. We observed that with increasing amounts of tetrabutyl ammonium chloride, the EE drops precipitously to virtually racemic product to 80 mol percent, which is consistent with catalyst inhibition. Additionally, we observed that at lower loadings of tetrabutyl ammonium chloride, the yield and conversion decrease with increasing amounts of ammonium chloride, which is also consistent with catalyst inhibition. However, at higher loadings, we observed that the yield and conversion increase with increasing amounts of ammonium chloride, which is inconsistent with catalyst inhibition alone. This indicated that the tetrabutyl ammonium chloride may not simply be an inhibitor, but also may be promoting the reaction on its own. We therefore investigated the effect of the tetrabutyl ammonium chloride on the racemic background reaction, that being the reaction under the same conditions but in the absence of catalyst, and found that at 20 mol percent, tetrabutyl ammonium chloride does catalyze the racemic reaction, inducing significant rate acceleration as you can see by the increase in conversion and yield. To further investigate this observation, we examined the effect of tetrabutyl ammonium salts with different counterions and found that tetrabutyl ammonium benzoate also induced rate acceleration, while tetrabutyl ammonium salts with non-basic and non-nucleophilic anions such as PF6 and BF4 did not catalyze this reaction. The next question we had was whether or not dialkyl ammonium chlorides had these same effects. So we examined the effect of diisoamyl ammonium chloride and dibenzyl ammonium chloride on both the catalytic and racemic background reactions with diisoamylamine. When added to the catalytic reaction, these salts resulted in a small decrease in EE. However, it's difficult to compare their effects and discern how profound they are. However, we observed that these salts had significantly different effects on the racemic background reaction, with dibenzyl ammonium chloride inducing rate acceleration and diisoamyl ammonium chloride affording no rate acceleration. Taken together, these results can help us begin to understand the effects of amine structure on selectivity we observe. The lower selectivity observed with dibenzylamine compared to diisoamylamine may not simply be the result of the lower intrinsic enantioselectivity in the catalytic reaction with phenylphosphonic dichloride, but also the result of the ability of dibenzyl ammonium chloride to catalyze a racemic background reaction compared to diisoamyl ammonium chloride. So now we can begin to make sense of the variation in EE we observe with different amines and why this reaction is not general for all secondary amines. While the lack of generality for different amines is not ideal, we had successfully observed very high levels of enantioselectivity with diisoamylamine. So moving forward with diisoamylamine, we decided to explore the synthetic utility of this method because, as I alluded to earlier, chlorophosphonamidates could be used as chiral building blocks, and this is because they possess two orthogonally reactive leaving groups. It may not come as a surprise that the chloride on these intermediates is a reactive leaving group that can be stereospecifically displaced by a broad variety of nucleophiles. However, additionally, the amino group on these building blocks can also serve as a leaving group. While upon initial inspection, one might think this nitrogen is akin to the nitrogen of an amide, the orbital overlap between nitrogen and phosphorus is quite poor. So the nitrogen atom on these chlorophosphonamidates is actually sp3 hybridized and quite basic. Therefore, this amino group can be protonated under acidic conditions and activated as a leaving group to undergo stereospecific displacement by alcohols. Thus, we hypothesized that chlorophosphonamidates could serve as bifunctional electrophiles, serving as precursors for the synthesis of a broad variety of stereogenic and phosphorus molecules. So to explore the scope of products we could access using these intermediates, we considered that there were three variables we could examine, the aryl group, the nucleophile that displaces chloride, and the nucleophile that displaces the amino group. And we systematically explored the scope of each of these variables. The first thing we explored was the aryl group on the phosphonic dichloride. So we tested various dichlorides with different substituents on the arine and observed that overall the EE landscape was quite flat. 
with all the urines tested giving similarly high levels of enantioselectivity. Significantly, the intrinsic selectivity of the reaction appears to be relatively agnostic to the electronic character of the urine, with both paramethoxy and paratrifluoromethylphenyl phosphonic dichloride giving virtually the same EE. We next explored the scope of nucleophiles that could displace chloride on these building blocks. The propensity of chloride to undergo nucleophilic displacement allowed for a broad variety of substituents to be installed in this step, with virtually every nucleophile we tried reacting with near-perfect enantiospecificity, including phenoxides, alkyl and aryl thiols, deprotonated carbamates, and Grignard reagents. This aspect of the chlorophosphonemidate building blocks allows for the most diversity in the scope of products that can be accessed using this method. And we next set out to test whether or not the amino group on all of these products could indeed be displaced. Under conditions, we optimized for displacement of the amino group on these molecules using parotol sulfonic acid in running the reactions in methanol. Each of these compounds readily underwent substitution with methanol to form the corresponding methoxy substituted products with high enantiospecificity. Additionally, we also found that other alcohols could be used, such as ethanol and allyl alcohol, to afford the corresponding alkoxy substituted compounds with high enantiospecificity as well, whereas propargyl alcohol gave moderate enantiospecificity. Now, one thing you might note is that both the displacement of chloride and the displacement of the amino group require the use of excess nucleophile. However, we wanted to apply this method to the synthesis of stereogenic and phosphorus targets bearing more complex and valuable substituents. Given preceding work has shown that when attached to phosphorus, thiols can be readily displaced by alkoxides, we hypothesize that this phosphonothioate may be able to serve as a chiral building block for the phosphonylation of precious alcohols. And indeed, we found that in the presence of magnesium chloride and Hunix base, this phosphonothioate readily underwent reaction with little to no excess alcohol to form the corresponding phosphonylated molecules with complete stereospecificity, affording phosphonylated adenosine and amino acids with very high levels of DR. We also found that this phosphonate product bearing an electron-deficient aryloxy group readily underwent reaction with little to no excess Grignard reagent, including sterically hindered Grignards, making it a useful building block for accessing a variety of enantio-enriched phosphinate ester products. And we decided to apply this three-step synthesis of highly enantio-enriched phosphinate esters to the synthesis of a phosphinate-based eutrophin modulator, which has been reported as a potential treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Subjection of this dichloride to the reaction conditions and subsequent reaction with sodium paratrifluoromethylphenoxide yielded the phosphonamidate in 95% EE and 68% yield as a white crystalline solid, enabling confirmation of absolute configuration by X-ray crystallography. Next, subjection of this phosphonamidate intermediate to acidic conditions in methanol allowed an antiospecific installment of the methoxy group on the target. And finally, displacement of the aryloxy group by ethyl magnesium chloride installed the ethyl group on the target, completing the synthesis of the eutrophin modulator in 94% EE and 43% overall yield over three steps. Now that we had established the utility of chlorophosphonamidates as bifunctional electrophiles via displacement of the chloride and amino group, we also wanted to explore the utility of this catalytic reaction as a means for accessing nitrogen-substituted stereogenic and phosphorus targets. As we discussed before, the enantioselectivity varies with amine structure, so we cannot install a broad variety of amines in the catalytic reaction itself with high EE. However, we noted that n allylbenzylamine undergoes this reaction with reasonably high enantioselectivity and good yield. And we reasoned that n allylbenzylamine could act as an ammonia surrogate in this reaction, as it possesses two protecting groups, a benzyl group and an allyl group, which can be removed and replaced. Therefore, we reasoned that we could use the product formed from this amine as an N-protected chlorophosphonamidate, which potentially could allow divergent access to a variety of nitrogen-substituted targets. As a proof of concept for this strategy, we decided to apply this method to the synthesis of a matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor. Under modified conditions using 20 mol percent catalyst, paramethoxy phenylphosphonic dichloride underwent reaction with n allylbenzylamine, and after a subsequent reaction with allyl alkoxide, the corresponding phosphonamidate product was formed in 89% EE and 88% yield. Next, ring-closing metathesis was used to close the seven-membered ring on the target, affording the cyclic phosphonamidate in 94% yield. Subsequently, subjection of this intermediate to palladium on carbon in the presence of trifluoroacetic acid under a hydrogen atmosphere resulted in both reduction of the alkene and hydrogenolysis of the benzyl group, affording the deprotected phosphonamidate. At which point, the nitrogen was deprotonated by NHMDS and underwent reaction with alpha bromoethyl acetate to afford this glycine ester-derived product, which is a known direct precursor to the MMP inhibitor, concluding the formal synthesis of this product. 
And this was just a proof of concept, but you could imagine other applications of these intermediates for the synthesis of a broad variety of nitrogen-substituted targets, such as carbonic and hydrous inhibitors and abscisic acid agonists. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my graduate research lab and my funding sources. Thank you to my advisor, Eric Jacobson, and my whole research lab for their support. And thank you to the NIH and BMS for their financial support. And thank you to you all for listening. Thank you for joining us for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Catherine for a very interesting talk. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.